Welcome everybody in virtual land. Uh, we are Corbett and Grace Lunsford. Um, we built the house on the left mm -hmm. and we're gonna be hopefully addressing some of the questions that you might have in this virtual. You're welcome to get in touch with um, both of the, the parties involved in today's presentation uh, online. Sorry, we can't take questions because obviously pandemic. Pandemic. No fun. But yeah, we're very approachable um, on Instagram. This guy replies a lot. And um, YouTube, is a, YouTube great place, is a great place as well. But Grace and Corbett Lunsford. And now we're going to hand it off to our good friend, Bill Stone. Yeah, who's building a house at the same time, Bill. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Corbett and Grace. Um, Bill Spone, True Tech Tools. I live in Pittsburgh, PA. The company's in Magadar, Ohio. Uh, yeah, we, we also built a home around the same time that uh, Grace and Corbett did. Uh, high performance home. We actually call it personalized performance because uh, not a, the definition of high isn't exactly the same for everyone. So uh, just in juxtaposition here, they're in Atlanta, I'm in Pittsburgh, but solar still works in Pittsburgh. So we, we will talk a little bit more about that shortly. <laughs> so the big picture for Marilyn and I was a home to age in place. It's our first new home. It's also going to be our last new home. So it had to have all the characteristics and qualities that we wanted to have built into it. Uh, one of the prime things was attractiveness. Uh, I said, flattering the landscape. I want to look out my office window, get lost in the view. Comfort and attractiveness were at the very top of the list, fitting in with the landscape. We initially went down the path of passive house that seemed appealing. Uh, one of the lessons we learned was that wasn't something that was affordable for us, uh, but we did learn a lot about that and for, employed some passive house features. Uh, we did learn about modular construction. In the, actually, in the search for Passive House, we learned about modular construction and found a great local builder who uses that mode of construction. Fell in love with that. I'm a big advocate of modular construction now. One of our goals and aspirations was to be all electric, to tread very lightly in the environment because electricity can be and keeps on getting greener and greener from renewable sources, uh, whereas combustion sources don't. Uh, we also have net zero aspirations. And my latest gauge on that is I think we will make it on an annual basis as being a net zero consumer for this home. And again, personalized performance. So you hear more, more about those details shortly. And on our end, um, I, I like your personalized performance uh, phrase. We call it performance tuned on mm -hmm. our house because also we, yeah. we are on the same page. The reason that we partnered with Bill on this presentation is because we shared a lot of the same goals, which we'll get to in just a second, but we went about it in completely, completely different ways. ways. <laughs> and actually having learned about modular construction through Bill's process, we're a big fan of modular now yeah. too. Uh, nice. so for us, we have a young family. We have uh, two children plus one on the way. So we're at a different phase of life than Bill and Marilyn. Um, and five years ago, we took that little tiny house on wheels that we built in five months. Uh, and you can watch that on our YouTube channel as well. It's called the Tiny Lab uh, with our very first baby. <laughs> and we hit the road uh, and found ourselves transitioning from Chicago via the entire United States down to Atlanta, where uh, we found that piece of land. You can see me as a tiny little speck. <laughs> yeah, so we have just shy of three acres, but we're inside the perimeter. If you know Atlanta, the perimeter is kind of how you judge whether you're urban or suburban or rural. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems like we're in a rural setting. You can't see other houses out the yeah. windows, but, um, but it's, it's amazing it's inside. So what we wanted to do though specifically was, as opposed to Bill's uh, vision, we wanted to build it ourselves. We wanted to design it ourselves so that we would understand what it takes to design it. Because of course we're, running trainings a lot mm -hmm. and specializing in consulting to help people with their projects is one of the things that we do. And so it really helped our perspective and my perspective, especially as the technical side of the company to understand everything that goes into framing the house, designing the framing of the house, inspecting the windows, installing the windows, all that stuff. Understanding the time required for mm. construction and what it brings to your relationships as well. That's true. And we've been married for quite a long time. So people are like, you're still married. Yes. Uh, and also, we, we were using the house. Like, of course, it takes a really long time. You'll see when we get to the schedule. Uh, and it was me and my mom and dad were my crew. And that sounds ridiculous, but we're trying to tell a story. 
And that's one of the major points of our build was that we wanted to have, to have it be stretched out and like really delve into it because we used it on the Home Diagnosis television show season two, which we're doing a screening of uh, on Wednesday night of this conference. And I hope you'll join us for that. And then it's also all on YouTube as well. We've got over a hundred videos of the, the description and demonstration of the build. And while that building process does sound a little ridiculous, I do think it's one that people are starting to re-embrace in the United States. Um, I think it's stayed uh, embraced in Europe and other other countries for sure. We've we've met foreigners who are like, yeah, oh yeah, I built my brother's house with him. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so so we we're interested in in helping understand that story. Right. Uh, and, and the last thing is that we really wanted to use a widely available and affordable systems and components because we're going on PBS or on YouTube and showing people what is possible. And we didn't want to be saying, if you want to build high performance, you have to do, like Bill mentioned, you have to have a passive house certified. You have to use these kinds of windows from Europe. You have to use this kind of tiny uh, HVAC system that is not available in your market, you have to special order it. So we really like, there's all kinds of things that are great in theory, um, but not really workable for a ton of people in practice. And we wanted to try and make this, you know, as, as embraceable by a ton of people yeah. as possible. And that even happened to us with some of the products we really wanted to use and then found out that they really weren't feasible. Okay. So here's a sequence of events. Grayson Corver will let you explain a little bit. Great. So, so it, what was fun about this is that Bill, uh, Bill and Marilyn and us, we, we worked out the same basic schedule. We, we built the house within the same framework in these two different parts of the country. For us, we bought our land in April 2017. We moved our tiny lab onto it. Mm -hmm. And then we immediately had to start working on the land because it hadn't... It hadn't been lived on. And, and lived on is a, uh, an interesting word. Um, since 2006. So there was 11 years of dumping and debris and no services on our land. And it was a rooming house before that. And this was like an old homestead. So there wasn't even a water line. So I literally had to dig the trench myself, which- With my uh, little it, brother. It begins. <laughs> He's a control freak. Why is he doing this? So we dug 500 linear feet of trench with Grace's little brother and then planted the water line and, and all that stuff. Then we broke ground and you can see between October 2018 and January 21, all of the stuff that went in there. You might think that's a ridiculous schedule. And I'll just tell you, this was my full-time job. <laughs> uh, I was on site basically every day. I, yeah. Grace let me work six day weeks for parts of it. But uh, in large part, I made her promise me that she would really strictly make me take two days off a week. So we tried to take like a day during the week and then a day on the weekend, normally Sunday and just not work on the house. But, but we like, took a lot of six day weeks. Man, I have no nice clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so I have, yeah. All my clothes are work clothes. I have a million t-shirts from like um, product partners that we've worked with. And so, and, and the, they all have mastic on them. And the other thing in building the land so that we could be ready to, to go into the schedule um, was we also built another tiny human at the same time. And I also made Corbett promise me that I would not lose him to another house build because with my first pregnancy, we were deep into building the tiny house and hitting the road. So I just, I wanted more of his support there too. So that is another thing that happened in 2018 before we broke land. So much family affair. <laughs> yeah. So we were actually considering what we were going to do as we retired back in 2014, started to think ahead. I'm, I'm a little bit of a planner, a little bit of a planner freak. Um, but in 2018, we actually bought the land. We actually bought the land. We decided to contract it on the day that your baby was born. I don't know if you remember that, 3 12 18. It's a day you'll remember. Yeah. Uh, and then we, we signed on with a passive house architect. Uh, and we only stuck with them for five months um, because that was just not the way we we're going to go we found the passive house or the modular builder because they presented themselves as passive house architects. They are trained to be, but they'd never built one yet. Um, so we found them just in a Google search and we're like amazed that they were local. They work with a local factory about 70 miles from here called Structural Modular Incorporated SMI in Strattonville, Pennsylvania. We took a factory tour and actually part of the modules that we toured uh, were the ones that were going to be installed by the owner of the Builder. Um, Elliot Fabri was building, 
his own modular home for a city lot, a 22 foot wide city lot. Uh, and we saw his house being built and then we saw it in July being set on site. So we really got to live the process. We actually, we did blower door testing on his house. We did walkthroughs. We looked at all the materials of construction. So we had a real intimacy with what was going on. Uh, when you work with a modular factory, at least this one, they have something called the hard card, which means we're going into a factory environment. Everything is defined, right? <laughs> Sign on the dotted line, or you will pay for change orders because we can't do things like you can on stick built or site built construction. They literally have a factory assembly line. The modules are pushed through the factory. Uh, they can be worked on from all six sides. Uh, there's, they're run, running on rails and two different lines to the factory. Really cool thing, all the materials are under roof for the whole time. They come off the truck, they go into the factory. Everything's pr protected and sort of environmentally controlled. We, we were able to get the modules built during the month of October, it took the whole month pretty much. Uh, the foundation was uh, excavated. Here we have basements uh, and the house was set both in January. Uh, we did have some speed bumps along the way. We thought there was a sewer line we could connect to, but that wasn't the case. So we had to design an on-site septic, move the house a little bit, rearrange a few things. Uh, COVID hit, there was a, a construction ban uh, by the governor of Pennsylvania for about six weeks. Uh, that slowed us down. Uh, we were trying to find water on site from March uh, until September through two, two different contractors three different wells, but yet we found water. And then the plumbing inspectors came under uh, felony charges in our county and plumbing inspections <laughs> were, were delayed. Uh, so they, that, that, that also took a while because they, of course, they wouldn't let us move in unless, you know, plumbing was, was in place. You know, and Bill, you're such a planner. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. <Look> I know. <laughs> right. Lesson I, for one lesson learned right. for everybody watching. Plan all you want. Yeah. yeah. Like, Life is going to just, if it makes you happy, plan. Yeah. that's one of the main differences, Bill, you'll appreciate this. My dad has the same kind of brain as, as you do, mm -hmm. which is the plan that like, he, he's a contract security attorney. So he wanted to have everything about the, the, just like your builders did everything decided before we even start. And, and I'm just like, I know that this is going to, things are going to go horribly wrong. So I would rather just start and not yeah. plan at all. Cause I, it hurts my feelings less than having my plan go in the garbage. Yeah, we, we went into it with eyes wide open. Um, it, it did get a little frustrating. Our, our marriage did hold up just fine through all the decision making and you know comp compromises we had to make, mainly with time. Uh, we did move in in November, middle November. Uh, not even our appliances. I didn't mention that our appliances were on back order for for six months. Uh, so we hosted Thanksgiving uh, with a college room dorm fridge. Uh, that's all we could. That we were only we weren't going to buy another fridge. So. You could also call that a tiny lab fridge. Yeah, a tiny <laughs> lab fridge. Okay. Oh yes, I'm not until you try it. <laughs> and and then we've been tweaking it since we moved in. I'll talk a little bit about some of the tweaking, some of the lessons learned, and things that that didn't work quite right, and uh, some of the communications issues. Uh, so common goal wise, you'll see that we pretty much had exactly the same things. Number one is. We wanted to build forever homes. We also wanted them to last a lot longer mm -hmm. than a typical home in America does. Our mortgages are 30 years here. Typically, we're building for the life of the mortgage. The mortgage term in Switzerland is 100 years, wow. and they have no inheritance tax there. So guess how long they built their houses to last for, right? So, so we both were kind of looking for this uh, goal. And also, you'll see that beautiful ergonomic spaces, what Bill calls comfort and beauty. Mm -hmm. It's like in real life, we could say, you know, we could sit here at the home performance conference and say all day long that we want to have a scientifically superior home or one that's very durable or one that's energy efficient or whatever any of the buzzwords are. Like, honestly, if you are married, <laughs> you're, you, you need to have the space be like nice. That's so important. And it's not on the list of things that we learn about in building science land. Right. So, um, and, and like windows need to be bigger. You need to have more windows mm -hmm. saying, I'm going to have a point, you know, 5% window to, um, wall or, you know, total enclosure ratio or what are like picking a number. And then you get here and it's like, Oh, I'm not happy because there's not light. Right. Or, or you 
you pick that window and you framed it and then your wife walks into the room and goes but i can't see out of it because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not tall enough <laughs> which is partly her fault for being so short um but perfect control as you can see my stuff got into number three uh, and also on Bill's side, like being married is important first, and then you can have all the science stuff. Perfect control over the, the temperature, the relative humidity, the pressures, which is a big thing when we're talking about houses that are as airtight as both of these are. Mm -hmm. um, the airflow and then the indoor air quality. Uh, mm -hmm. Since we're, you know, we're all trying to tell the story here of what's going on, we need to have it actually work. I'll tell you like one thing for us, we have cats. Bill, do you have cats? We don't, but we have a, a grand dogger. Nice. Okay. Uh, so you walk into our house, and this is something that we can't, I, I show because we have tours at our house now. You can come and visit our, our place, but um, you walk into our house, and in the front hallway is the most disgusting thing in the entire house. It's the cat litter box. It's in the front hallway. You will walk past it when you come into our house, and you will never smell it. No. And like that kind of thing is just, it had to be right. And so we did a lot of planning for that. And of course, that's where it, you, you got to have planning, not, mm -hmm. not knocking planning at all. But um, but anyway, those kinds of things, getting into the proven technologies, I'm going to hand it off to Bill to explain the rest of this list. But the, um, the fact that we were both kind of experimenting, Bill sure. in modular land, and us with our self-build and, you know, yeah. um, was kind of, yeah. Yeah, the, the we'll talk about the ERV we chose, which is a conditioning ERV, um, not really in widespread use. Uh, we introduced it to our builder and they've been using it on, on many of their projects going forward. Uh, we found a solar contractor uh, for the solar installation we had put in. Our builder now features that one as their primary solar installer. So uh, in a way, our experience is helping others lead and learn. Uh, and I use the phrase a lot uh, with concepts stolen from the future. I, I think that sounds nice and edgy. Um, and I put in the, the uh, future Lunsford family. Uh, ah. That's a picture you guys are. Um, and, and speaking of teams of experts and contractors, I had a lot of influencers in this. Uh, one of the topics is mean radiant temperature. Uh, that, that's a nerdy topic, but leads to very, very high comfort and control mean radiant temperatures. Uh, Robert Bean was sort of was my guru there. Uh, having light and open spaces. Uh, Chris Dorsey introduced me to a book called A Pattern Language. I, it's by Christopher and, and others. I suggest you look it up. There are, are sort of uh, blogs about it online. Little short stories, um, stories, but architectural stories about different patterns of putting things together. Marilyn and I poured through, there's like 400 little stories in there. We didn't look through all of them, but we, we got some ideas that, that led us to certain aspects of design. That was part of our research, part of our planning uh, was to sort of build off of others. Um, and then reasonableness and timeliness, we, we thought we were gonna move in in 2019. <laughs> Uh, we thought it was going to be late in 2019. It ended up being very late in 2020. However, it, that all worked out. But, but budget-wise, uh, it, it's interesting. Um, sort of the, the cost of the land was about a third. Uh, the cost of the modular home leaving the factory was about a third. And the rest of it is finishing on site other details, uh, you know, HVAC, things are added on mechanical, added on site and landscaping. So um, it, it was interesting, like when you go shop for an existing home, you see one number, but when you're putting something together from new, from scratch, uh, you really have to understand your budgets. 100%. So my design and planning, uh, lots of illustrations and graphs and numbers, huh? Uh, so we actually, in the upper left there is what's called a passive house planning package report, uh, which is done when we were look, still looking at passive house, we contracted with a, a trained consultant who knows how to operate the 16 megabyte spreadsheet. The goal of it, however, is allows you to substitute in construction details before you put pen to digital paper. So we could look at the impact of choosing one window over another on the heat load and figure out, it, is that gonna result in a larger, smaller system? Uh, we could look at indoor design temperatures. We could look at 
uh, the, the impact of um, air sealing, the in, impact of exterior insulation. That's what led us to feel comfortable in the fact that we weren't going to put on two inches of exterior foam, foam insulation, but put on less than that we, because we modeled it. The center section there is a cool calc, which is the load calculation. So in addition to getting the, the building energy model, we got it modeled for HVAC. We even modeled it thinking about the water flow and uh, in, in trying to route that. This is a compromise that the, the factory wouldn't go with um, because they said the energy code or the housing code requires a certain size water line. And then we actually proved them that they were looking at the code from six years ago. Our design was allowed. They still wouldn't go for it. They were, they were just stubborn on that point. Um, but to, to use like a manifold to distribute hot water around instead of waiting for hot water, you folks chose, chose a different approach. Uh, we were trying to use conventional techniques, but just a slightly modified design. This comes from the, the mind of Gary Klein. Uh, we did have, uh, you know, of course, the layout with the, the cool calc, uh, the builder did not follow our plan. I actually don't know exactly how things are sort of wired up with the HVAC. We do have four zones. Uh, I still have to kind of plot this out and measure each one of the outlets individually. Um, but more or less, we got to the point we wanted to be at. We had to struggle over getting a larger return because we wanted as much return for maximum capacity where they said there won't always be that capacity because you have a low load home. Uh, in the upper right corner, that's my that's their first model of the house. We actually, the builder, excuse me, the factory was looking at our builder's design of six modules. And they said, hey, what about four? We could build four modules, uh, each of them 14 and a half feet wide, 64 feet long, um, and 14 feet tall. We can build them and truck them to your site. So they, they saved us the cost of two additional modules, which was a big savings. Uh, we also did sort of a model after the fact with Russ King's quick model. Um, we used that to get to nail down the exact volume. I went around with the laser distance meter, measured every room, showed him the plans. And he's like, hey, your rooms aren't the same as the plans. It's yeah, that's right, that happens. So we do have a very precise volumetric model of the house, which allows us to give a very precise uh, ACH 50 for a blower door test. The, the builder did do some exterior renderings, renderings, a couple interior renderings. That does look exactly like our kitchen right there. Uh, a little bit color change there, but um, so we didn't have a lot of um, those tools available to us. We're a little disappointed. We didn't get to see 3D walkthroughs. Uh, we had to do a lot of blocking and planning in our existing home with blue tape on the floor and just trying to figure out how much space do we really want and need? And, and went back and forth ourselves to do that. Nice. So we, in case you didn't catch us say it, we've been living for the last five years before <laughs> we moved into this house in 200 square feet. That's the tiny lab in the top left there with our solar panels that we used to have. We do not have solar now. That's one of the things we came from having solar and decided not to do solar in our house. Bill has the solar on his, so stay tuned to, to learn more about that. But um, you can see the inside, what it looks like. It was not a, um, it's, it's not a shabby place. It's, it's not shabby. Nice. No, we got, actually, we got called hippies that don't settle on the national tour, which I thought was fun and maybe very, very, very appropriate. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, how much space do you need is, the, is a good, question to ask yourself, especially when moving from a really small space uh, into a much larger space for us. I think sometimes we thought, oh, we don't need that much space. And, um, and as we were designing and building this, we did consult with an yeah. actual architect because yeah, we built the plans architect. ourselves and then handed them to our friend Jody, who is an architect. And, um, and she looked through it and, and was like, mm, how about this instead? Because like we don't, you know, we've been living in a 200 square foot box right. for five years. We don't know anything about how much space people, normal humans <laughs> um, are interested in. So, and also we were having more children and stuff like that. So right. the, the one thing on the top right there that you'll see is that the house is, um, it is, it's in three pieces. It's in the shape of a monitor barn, but then there's that classic thing where you kind of shift everything. In building science land, that's to get cross breezes. You can put windows on two faces. 
we didn't do that. Hmm. Just did it. And then like, it's cool. It's a cool shape, but we didn't use any of the crossbury stuff because honestly, you don't open windows in a performance tuned house. This is something that they don't really talk about. But, uh, but you'll see that one piece that's totally separated from the house is quite literally an entire third of the house third of the house that is separated separated by an entirely different crawl space entirely different wall system it's double walled has its own erv has its own uh dehumidifier has its own HEPA filtration loop has its own heating and cooling system that is our multi-purpose fun room so we've got 2200 square, square feet of uh living space and then we've got 800 square feet of this uh, multi-purpose room which is doubles as our training center um it is also our dance room and our music recording studio and, and our, our party theater. room and our slumber <laughs> house, you know, like all the things. So the the picture with the black there is part of the prep, the planning for this, because I'm not a good builder. And, and a good builder, by the way, just so everybody's clear, is somebody who's good at scheduling and budgeting. Mm -hmm. And I am not good well, at those things. Grace is and, the budgeter. And I would also add as a good people person. Well, that's and I can do that yeah. part, but honestly, what we've got here is a 1500 square foot workshop mm -hmm. and I could not have built this house. Without I that have workshop. no idea how people <laughs> do it with your 22 foot wide city lot bill that you were mentioning. Yeah. Like, where do you put things when they get delivered on site? I had 1500 square feet and I swear it's still packed down there. Like I can't drive my truck into it. <laughs> so we, in the process of, of designing this, um, put out four webinars on the pro on like the, the enclosure, the engines, which is what we call anything that moves heat or air around bells and whistles, and then just kind of the overview. And you can see all of those on the YouTube channel. But the, the planning for us was really based in the fact that we knew that we needed to design something that was designable by us, buildable by us, and then was probably never going to have to be worried about being sold to somebody who wasn't a freak like we are. Yep. Uh, we could do kind of whatever we wanted to. Yeah, the, the livable by us is like the, the capstone on that comment. And, and houses are built for people. When we talk a lot about a lot of these things, the science underlies what you deliver to people, which includes the space, which includes the ventilation. By the way, we do windows, open windows. Yes. So um, we, we do shut down the system to do open windows. So. Yeah, we can. Yeah. We, we, we have not a lot yet. Well, Corbett hasn't been in the house too much when I open the window. <laughs> oh. I like to be able to hear the girls when they're outside playing. Yeah, and the birds. Yes, the birds are nice. So tell us about your foundation. Yeah, so foundation was people with heavy, Rain. heavy side. Okay, there's yeah. a lot of trauma uh, built into all this entire build for us, which I'm not going to regret. I, I like that, that we have that. But people will say, oh, you should start in summer or you should start in springtime i don't it doesn't matter you no matter when you start your build especially if you're doing a self build you will have a rainy season season hit somewhere in there we had one when we were starting so this what you see at the uh, top right is the state of when we were about to be pouring our uh the slab and putting the foundation walls in and and it was just like that I, I was out there uh, literally like with the pump in the middle of the night <laughs> with a trash pump. It's called a trash pump. It's something that sucks water out of holes, dirty water. And so um, it was pretty horrible. This tarp thing that you see that I've got laid out over the, that's, um, that's a lot of tarps. Those are billboard tarps. It doesn't work. What you really would do if you wanted to be slick about it, lesson learned here is erect a circus tent over the top of your site. That would be the only way to guarantee that you're not going to have all the problems that we had. By the way, this picture at the bottom right, it, it, maybe you can't see because the, the screen is too small, but the very first day that we broke ground, we found both a huge amount of trash. Yes. There's no reason for pieces of wood to be buried underground. Yeah, you unless can kind of put it almost see the sticks from an, a previous structure. There was an old foundation that we knew we were going to have to break up and move out of the way. But after we broke that up and moved it out of the way, we found another structure buried underneath it. Somebody had knocked a house down and just put it in the ground where you would build your next, the next house. Yeah. So we had to dig way deeper over there to get all the trash out because you have to get down to like compacted, clean you know, soil, un, untampered with yeah. dirt. And then we also found at the same time these red, that red shape, that's the, the layout like. of the house. And the red thing is this gigantic rock mass 
the geotechnical engineer that we hired to come and make sure that we were doing things right said they pro he wasn't going to call them rocks because he wasn't sure that there was dirt underneath them. He wasn't sure there was anything underneath them. He thought that probably they were some potentially part of Stone Mountain, which is like right, miles, yeah, dozens of miles away from here. But the, you know, down when you get down far enough. Anyway, we're in granite country. It's fine. So so we basically had to dig way down further mm -hmm. than we could possibly build because if you want to take rock out. Number one, you have to blast it. Right, and you don't know if you are stepping into an $8,000 project or an $80,000 project. And like we're 8,000, maybe that's tenable. We can squeeze and make that work. 80 would have really set us back in, and into places we wouldn't know how to handle. So lesson number one, be flexible. And, we're on lesson number 15. Okay, yeah. lesson, le, I, I, I might just keep saying one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you had to be flexible because we had an eight foot basement planned and we had to adjust that and make it a four foot crawl space. Mm, we, wow. We did not have an eight foot basement plan. Yeah, well, it was an eight foot space. It, I think it would have gone to six feet height. But anyway, anyway it doesn't yeah. matter. Uh, I, I, I always, I always planned for it to be a crawl space but somebody <laughs> brought up when we found these rocks we're like why don't you just build a basement if you're going to go that because we had to dig down so deep so we didn't want to move the house for a bunch of reasons right we opted instead to spend ten thousand extra dollars on renting a skid steer which i drove and a compactor which is this real fun little um, remote controlled thing that you drive around and then we trucked in tons of fresh dirt and when I say fresh, I mean, it's like old, there's no organic matter in it. The rain then delayed us for a long time. And every time we came in and it was like, oh, it was dry for a few days. And we'd set the forms and then they would come out and after it rained and every step that you took messes with the stuff. So we actually had to bring back in gravel after digging down further. And it was like a big mess. You can see it on the YouTube channel anyway. But the last thing that I'll say is that the footings were exposed right. for nine months which some people would get super freaked out about. I know that it wasn't an issue because in the middle picture here where Bill's cursor is, you can see that um, we have gravel. We've got four to six inches of gravel under the entire slab. And so, and that the slab that we poured on top of that is only two inches thick, it's called a raft slab. It's not for supporting anything really, but we've got um, insulation. We had pango wrap uh, termite barrier. Mm -hmm. We had, uh, radon mitigation system that was um, potentially, you know, like getting ready to be put in. And we're going to talk about radon in the session too. Uh, but I knew that there was water going under the house, but I knew also that the water going under the house was able to go without messing with the house because of this gravel communication line. So we could go straight under and go out and it wasn't going to hurt anything. And in fact, our house has not shifted. A lot of people were like, oh, your house is going to fall apart in the first year. And it hasn't happened. So, so anyway, that was and the reason it had to stay exposed, by the way, is because we needed to add this exterior insulation. Can't add the exterior insulation until you blah, 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 blah. So all the scheduling stuff, honestly, now I have more respect for builders knowing, number one, that they have to be good at scheduling and budgeting, which if you, if you think a builder is everything to everyone, like that sounds really meager. But honestly, scheduling, if you can get be good at scheduling, I am in awe. I don't yeah. know how to do it. Did you run into any material shortages? Not ever, Bill. I had one. That insulation got delivered a year before we used it. Wow. I, I was well yeah. prepared with my yeah. stuff. That's why we needed that workshop. That workshop. So foundation, in my case, we used a local contractor called Specialty Precast. Uh, and they built, like our house, they built the foundation panels, sub-assemblies in a factory. Their custom design. It's interesting that the crew that actually installs them are the factory workers that build them. They yeah. used to have a separate install crew, but they did crappy installs and they're so proud of their product. They actually shut down the factory to come out and do the installation. Cool. Uh, they're made with uh, 5,000 PSI concrete. They are not coated on the outside. Uh, that is, it's uh, compatible with water resistance. Uh, as you can see, it has uh, EPS foam insulation in it. The walls are warm. I mean, warm to the touch. They're not cold walls in the basement. There's a dual drain system on either side so that water is mitigated from below. The concrete floor is poured up to the edge of the foundation. So there's no edge losses. There's no thermal losses from the edge in this area down here. Uh, and it provides a nice tall basement that's ready to be finished. And we did finish it with drywall 
uh, materials. They also provide channels for, uh, for, for routing electrical um, straight through, although our contractor put up the drywall before I put electrical in. So <laughs> I've got all exposed electrical. That was the one communication breakdown. It's like, is that? You have exposed electrical now. Uh, well, I mean, I'm going to have to put in conduits on the outside surface of the basement wall. Ah, I see. Yeah, so it's not all that bad, but it wasn't what I desired to have done. They also fasten together. Um, they're bolted together, and there's a double uh, double tape, um, two, two tapes of, insul of uh, sealing material where they come together, and then they just uh, jam them together, and they're pretty darn airtight. Uh, and you can see the, even the corners have little bolts in them to keep them square. Oh, yeah. Very cool. And they, they, they use a crane also to, uh, to bring the panels in. And you can see the excavation there for some pads for, uh, for footers, for the supports uh, for the center beam of the house to support the two modules where they come together. So the idea of precast concrete coming up on site and showing up and being perfect at mm -hmm. from a factory makes me actually really nervous because yeah. what I found out when I was framing this place is that like there is just no such thing as perfectly plumb level and square. Uh -huh. And I have, thank God, one of my expert consultants is this 80 year old, he's not 80, but he's like an old dude who lives next door who's a carpenter. And so he'd come over and like not make us feel he's like, hey, if it fit, you know, it deviates by, you know, a quarter inch, nobody did, nobody's ever gonna notice. You're never gonna notice, you just fix it with blah, blah, blah. And so that fix it with, here's how you fix it. That came in really handy because of course we've got children on site. Don't be mad at me. This is our home, our, our tiny house is literally 25 feet away from the edge of the, the corner of the build. Um, I made mistakes. You can see in the middle picture there that the walls are made with two studs up to a certain point. And it's because I framed it wrong the first time and then I had to rip the thing off and then reframe it. Um, we had a structural engineer. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think that wall to your left, yeah, where where the cursor is right now. We actually, I think, I think we had to redo that three times, right? Uh, no, no, no. There was but, anyway. But but the one thing that I'd say is framing. When I used to be a hers raider, and for those of you who are hers raiders who are going out there and judging people for the Energy Star program mm. on their framing, and you you're like allowed one extra stud per 10 feet span, blah, blah, blah. Like, honestly, they do not teach you anything about framing as a Hertz Raider. I did not know anything about framing until I started framing houses, uh, the tiny lab and this house. And when you see, like, for example, in the picture that's sun drenched there with the, all the framing exposed and no, no sheathing on, between those two windows, there are five studs in a row. If I was in my nerd mode, 10 years ago, I would be like, nope, not allowed to have that. Uh, that's supporting the roof beam. So I, I'm just like so embarrassed remembering all the times when I said, oh, you're, you're not you're like, you shouldn't have all these studs here. I don't know what I'm talking about. You see the red lines on my plans up there? That's the structural engineer's report on how many of everything needs to be where. where? And what kind of clips I need to have that are like the hurricane uh, clips the and all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, it was just a real, it took a long time because I wanted to get everything as perfect as possible. And also some of the things that I was taught were obviously thought up by like people who don't build houses. And I think that that's something that we should know so, is happening. So lesson number one, um, <laughs> <laughs> have compassion for builders. Yeah, yeah I really hard, think man. whether they're building in a factory and, and bringing it there. I mean, as you said, I, I am impressed that they dropped their installation crew and just decided to get it done themselves because I, I really appreciate that. Um, if you want something done right, sometimes you got to do it yourself. So yeah, compassion. Yeah. Also, one thing that I'll say is that um, if everybody talks about like stacking your studs, right, like this floor 142. And the thing about it is that if you don't do that between the floor joists, and the studs, then you can't bring ducts up between floor joists, right. which I did not know mm -hmm. until I then was trying to install ductwork. And I was like, how am I supposed to do it? <laughs> so we had to install some soffits to reframe some soffits in because like I did it wrong.
Yeah, it's it's, it's a complex. Uh, it's amazing houses do come together. Um, our our structural uh, we we have a large vaulted area, twenty two foot high interior vaulted area. Um, you can see in the picture down here. Um, this is the first floor of that vaulted area. They put in these stringers uh, to hold the modules together, trans to build and transport them. They were then later cut out, and then the wall surface refinished to allow it to go up 22 feet. Um, this required a construction engineering consultant. Uh, and so we, we got in, and he did, it was like a 78-page report of all the vectors and thrusts and different things going on to make sure and it ended up being more about the wall bowing than actually falling down and needing to support the roof, but about the wall bowing under perhaps wind pressure. Uh, we um, ended up having to put in some structural members uh, and what we did, we then be, turned them into a design feature. Uh, they were 20 foot or 22 foot tall Douglas fir timber um, that were our exterior into the, interior into the room. The question was, do you want to bury them in the wall? It's like, no, let's, let's get rid of that thermal bridging, like you talked about before with uh, studying, but also let's, let's bring them out as a design element and they're sort of a feature against the pretty neutral tones that we have throughout the rest of the house. So you, you can see, and there's also these uh, 64 foot long LVL, laminated, laminated veneer lumber um, stringers, I guess, I called them braces. Uh, it, while the modules are being built, those are reference points, structural points, so that they can be constructed. Uh, they come to the site with that, they lift them into place, then they saw them off and reuse them. Um, that's one thing about uh, factory built. Uh, it, it's estimated it uses about 25, there's about 25% less waste building in the factory. Uh, we saw pieces of material that uh, were being used on, you know, just cutoffs. They, they have like barrels of cutoffs. They just throw them in the barrel. The next project comes along, the right size, they use it. They move it from project to project. Um, they use laser alignment uh, to, to build the modules. So you can see this going into a jig in the lower right-hand corner. The alignment of the modules uh, over 64 feet long, they were within three eighths of an inch wow. at, at the end. They touched at one end, there's a three eighths gap at the other end. There's six doorways that had to move into alignment on two different floors. Four were perfect, two needed adjustment, uh, a little bit of build out. So uh, it's uh, awesome what they can do in a factory uh, in terms of pre precision construction. And we, we benefited from that. Can I also just add that sure. having, you know, a two by four. Mm -hmm. How wide is it supposed to be? How thick is it supposed to be? I'm going to tell you right now that a lumber yard, if you're going to pay for, for like really good, perfect wood, which you don't know that you're not paying for that if you just get any old lumber yard. Yeah. Um, if you're not doing that, they're bringing you things that are not actually, like I was getting two by tens, they're supposed to be nine and a quarter, and they'd be nine and a half, or even nine and three quarters, or just nine. And so every single piece of wood was a slightly different dimension. Mm -hmm on site and it's sitting out in the sun and the rain. These guys have no sun shining on this stuff. There's no rain. The fact that you could, I mean, like, it just kind of blows my mind. Things were moldy before we even put them in the house because mm -hmm. you, you stack it, it's sitting there and like, what are you gonna do? So I, anyway, it's just like, I think that in this case, this is the beginning of where the factory thing totally beats field built. Yeah. You do have to make all the decisions up front though. You know, that, that hard card, the, the hard decisions you have to make. And you also just notice something else in terms of uh, sort of stretching limits. We did things that are not in alignment with building science or passive house. We have a lot of bump outs, uh, a lot of features, because we wanted to have that cord, so sort of beautiful look for it. Um, enclosure details, I'll, I'll jump on this real quick. Uh, we had two by six walls, 16 inches on center. Actually, it's 24 inch on center. I don't know why the slide said 16, probably because I wrote it. Um, we put in uh, fiberglass insulation in the cavities, uh, zip wall. We also had the zip wall. This is we hired a construction consultant by the name of Rhett Major, who helped uh, be the, sort of the intermediary from our crazy ideas of building science to the factory and to the builder. Uh, he requested that all the the fastener heads be uh, puttied with sealant, and they did that. Uh, on the zip wall. So we would gain sort of that moisture intrusion benefit as well as any kind of air sealing from just that minor puncture in the wall. 
Um, we also wrapped it with uh, this OpCore graphite impregnated EPS uh, to provide the thermal break, um, then a, a weather resistive barrier, and then uh, side, vinyl siding on top of that. And this was all predicated on being able to hang siding on two inch nails that could go through the inch and a half uh, foam to the wallboard. That's why we didn't go with thicker foam. We could have, we would have gotten a little benefit Sorry about that. Would have gotten a little benefit. Um, I've lost my way. <laughs> um, we would have gotten a little bit of a benefit from doing that, but we didn't uh, go that direction. Um, so the the sort of the summation for us: walls are our twenty eight, roof is our forty five, foundations are thirty, the windows are passive house, triple pane, argon field filled uh, windows made locally though. Um, not made in Europe, uh, and at our 6.6, .6, and then the doors are 12.5. Are mm -hmm. Nice. So for us, like Bill, uh, who was using a passive house tool to energy model, we used an energy model, which is what HERS Raiders use, it's called REM. And of course, we energy modeled this house. So we know that all of the, just like Bill's decisions on how much foam, or how, you know, in our case, how much exterior rock wool to use, um, how much cavity, how much air tightness, blah, blah, blah. And then also a load calculation. By the way, in case you're not clear, those two have to be both done because they are not, they're mutually exclusive. An energy model is not a load calculation. You, you got to do an actual manual J. And manual J softwares are not good at doing energy modeling normally. So the thing that you'll see on the right, which is for the pretty shot with Grace <laughs> shooting, you know, video yeah. for our we had to kind of stage things that we were getting ready for shooting the TV show, which yeah. is a very expensive process with our production crew, and also actually making progress on our bills, right. is that we had kind of set up a, a cross section of what it will look like, which is our rain screen. You don't have a rain screen, right? Correct. That's That was the, we were able to avoid the rain screen by going with final siding and the thinner foam. Gotcha. Cool. So we used wood siding, solid wood, um, which is cooked. It's thermally modified. And so we wanted to have a rain screen. I like the rain screen. We used it on the roof as well. And, um, and we used the, uh, a commodity competitor of Zip, invented by the same people, by the way, hmm. uh, interestingly, that is, the tape is different. And a lot of people were like, oh no, it's not gonna work. Only test it, and it's pretty amazing. I'll show you in a minute. But one thing that I will say is that the picture on the left is water getting into our dried in house all winter long. And I would move these buckets around. I literally like was collecting buckets. And you got, you got some buckets, can I borrow them? Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a real headache because it was before we got the metal roof on. The metal roof we went with was a commercial roof. It's like much more hardcore than a normal metal roof. Yeah. But until we had that on, for some reason, this Mento, the same stuff that Bill has on his walls was on our roof. And I think it's because it was on top of the rough side of OSB the splinters maybe were like, without being visually apparent, we're puncturing this thing. And we also have these real tall pine trees. So, um, we had these little cannons of, of, yeah, cannonballs of pine cones. <laughs> and so there were these little totally unfindable, we even tried to, to do it with like a reverse, yeah, like a blower gas door. leak test kind of, where we pressurized <laughs> the house and put soap bubbles. bubbles and, and it was not findable. So anyway, we, we just had to suffer through that and get to the, uh, thank get God. To the roof. Thank gosh, I just said, I'm a, I'm a dad. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide, if you would, Bill. We had all these other redundant details and redundancy is super, super important. Yeah. So uh, the picture on the top right is our house without any eaves at all, airtight, insulated. We did at that point, the blower door tests to make sure that everything was right. We also did what's called hurricane test. We call it that, it's not actually a hurricane, but it's something that I'm pretty sure nobody has ever done that I've met before. This guy is Landis Bennett. And he was like, you know, we could do a water intrusion test outside of a lab. We can actually just do it in the field. It's really easy to do a blower door and a pressure, uh, you know, a pressure washer. And so I was like, well, we're, we have, you know, we have a TV show, right? Like we need things that look awesome. So we did it and we got the house under 250 pascals yeah. of depressurization. That's five blower doors. That's, that's one inch of water column. And then we sprayed it with this pressure washer to find all of the moisture intrusion spots. And I will say that's something you can't do in the factory yeah. um, because it would make everything wet, but it was awesome. Like that was, and, and, and we found, be, and we found some spots. We sure did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, and you fix them. 
right then and there. So the, the things that were the lessons learned here was that number one, the blower door will always surprise you. Yeah. I was not sure that our house would be as tight as it is, but it was past passive house tightness. It was a 0.4 air changes per hour. Hmm. And, and again, I was a little bit worried about these tapes. I was literally looking at them and they were not looking like they were airtight. And it just, it's like use reasonableness and you just say, it's like mean radiant temperature. The word mm -hmm. mean is in there. It means just like, you know, the whole thing is important. No one detail is that important. So you can see uh, here that we had the electricians mm -hmm. run not the way that I asked them to the one time that I specified. And this is why you gotta be on site. You have to be on site. Somebody who, from the owners, like if you guys are representing a, a client who's a, an owner and you're going to go and visit the, the build site, I swear being there once a week is really not enough. You got to go at least twice a week, if not three times or, or yeah. every day, because they did that in one day, they wired up the house and they wired it all through the cavities sideways. Like Bill was talking about like, that's not, we would want a channel or something like that, but I'm going to install the insulation myself. And that makes it hard to do perfectly. So let's and, just use the crawl space instead. I asked right. him to go down. And we had built, we had built the crawl space and instructed the electricians to run everything through the crawl space. That was, that but was. But it gets, they're busy and they do yeah. what's easy and it's easier. Well, it's a one person job they do what's, a two person job. They do what's habit. It's, yes, I mean, sure. that's that's one of the giant curses of the building industry is habit yeah and i will say that we paid them enough that they had no problem with me changing i, yeah. I was like look you got to redo all this i'm sorry that i can't wow that okay and they were like hey we want you to be happy no problem they literally took it all out put it in through yeah. the floor they even did the interior walls down through the crawl space no upcharge at all because like that's that's what you get when you're working with somebody who's like quality is you say it one time, they forget they do it a different way. You say, hey, you, you screwed up and there's no lawsuit or like, hey, well, we quit or something like that. Yeah. We get some emails like that. <laughs> um, but then you see, we installed the windows over this thermal buck, mm -hmm. um, which if you know what that is, it's, it's cool. There are some structural things that come along with that. And and like, it's, I would but bore helps, everybody. Yeah, it helps with insula exterior insulation. Yeah, and I don't really like the word, um, thermal break or thermal bridge that much because it's like for in a session like this where we're all super nerds great let's talk about it but we, we you make the mistake when you're out in real life and you say thermal bridge or thermal break to a normal person yeah you deserve to have them never call you again because like that is just too nerdy they don't care and also it doesn't matter that much because exterior insulation saves you you can do whatever you need with your framing and like we had to change framing you just sometimes you got to put blocks in places and like yeah you got thermal bridging use exterior insulation, you don't have to care. You, I don't, literally don't use that word on a daily basis. Yeah. And so we built the eaves separately. And my lesson learned there is don't do that. It's not worth it. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting, it's an interesting theory. Uh, scientifically, it definitely makes sense and seems superior, but uh, it's a real pain in the ass really in is. a lot of ways. Um, but we also use triple, um, triple glazed as well and these are american made, made yeah. american made in, in denver alpen windows mm -hmm. got it so heating and cooling system that, that we installed and uh, it's for me it's an hac system because my v is separate uh, so it's a two-ton ducted air source heat pump made in montreal canada by detson uh, high sear we use four different zones uh, which is interesting now they're starting to live with the zones and understanding the, the great room with the big vaulted ceiling that's always almost always on at low uh, running when it's any bit cold outside the rest of the house doesn't need it the solar gain is sufficient to keep it warm as well as the circulation of the air. Um, we went with the nice uh, big air drop um, four inch horizontally mounted MERV filter. Uh, we did have heat strip. We do have heat strips for backups uh, heat um, that would produce basically around three tons of of heating load. Um, but the house is only only modeled out at two tons, just a little bit over. But we went with a conservative value or went went undersized a little bit. It's a high pressure air handler, and I'll show you in a minute what that actually means with the system they call Detson Smart Duct. Uh, you also notice the coil is mounted uh, horizontally. The, the heat pump coils mounted horizontally in the ductwork, um, which is an interesting application there. 
So outside, this is the, the outdoor unit, and you can see the ERV supplies, which we'll talk a little bit in a, about a minute. Uh, we do have snow here, uh, and I've also heard about even where you don't have snow concerns, if you get any kind of ice up, the ice that accumulates inside the uh, outdoor unit can actually break the coils. Uh, it's strong enough to actually crack the coils that are surrounding the unit. So even if you don't, you, you should always lift the outdoor unit. The, the smart duct system, which comes as part of the package with the heating and cooling system, uh, and actually have a little link down here if you want to see more of the detail. This is their computer fluid dynamic model of a standard register in the floor and how it mixes within the room versus how a small sort of a jet or nozzle. And this is actually in our house here. Those uh, One is actually the fresh air. Uh, the other three are the heating and cooling. Uh, and we really don't, besides hearing a little bit of air movement noise, we really don't hear that it's on. They're about 30 CFM max from each one of these nozzles. So that's sort of the increment that you can use when you size the zone uh, to, to match the loads, the, the projected loads. So there's these runs, uh, trunk lines that run down through the basement. And then uh, these saddles actually have a sealant on them when they're screwed into place, they seal the hose uh, for, for the ductwork. It's actually, it's a spiralized hose that's uh, insulated. It screws in to the, the seat here, screws into a seat in the wall, which is a 90 degree angle. So there's no, no kinking, uh, there's no obstruction. Uh, you only have to deal with sort of the, the linear length of the ductwork. And these are all, all the ducts were put in, in the walls, in the factory, and then just dropped into the basement and connected with the system. So again, this had to be all thought out in advance. Where's the heating and cooling unit going to go? Where could the duct runs go? You know, and everything was below the, the, uh, the floor joists so that they're basically there's the full space available uh, to run these things. And this all had to be thought out in the factory, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So on our side, it was, uh, first of all, you can see my two friends here on the left, Caleb in the red shirt and Brent. Caleb is from the HVAC School podcast. Brent is from the Tool Pros podcast and their uh, buddy is mine. Brent is local. Caleb came all the way from Myrtle Beach. Mm -hmm. He's 23 years old and he was the lead on installing our HVAC systems. I'm very happy to know him. I do not know in reality, practically speaking for a normal person trying to do what we did, how you would in any way do what we did without having friends like these. Because what I was able to do is install all the ductwork that you can see on the right. I installed all the water lines, all the ductwork, all the central vacuum pipes that you can see the PVC, mm -hmm. some of the electrical stuff. The, I set the equipment myself. Um, nobody's going to let you do that. The reason that I did that, by the way, is that I, I did go out for a bid for, H, for all the HVC work. I got one bid because it was the one local company who had trained with me, who I thought took what I talk about seriously and would understand the like potential barter, you know, trade off of like, oh, well, we could be on the YouTube channel. So I was like, oh, this is gonna be the best bid I'm gonna get. It was $40,000 just labor because we didn't even have to just pay labor. for the equipment. I asked for the equipment so that I could show it up. Yeah. And um, so anyway, I was like, wow, a message from the universe. I'm installing my own HP mm -hmm. systems. This is great. So these guys just came in and just uh, set up the coolant lines and commissioned the systems and made sure that they were running right. There's so much stuff that you have to know about electrical and low voltage and um, coolant systems. Right. And, all, and it's like, it's not worth it for you to just try and learn for one DIY install. Well, but at the same time, it is worth it for us because we are in the building performance world. Um, I mean, for the actual equipment install, which yeah. I didn't, you know, I set the, the, the units, but like connecting them together and making them work is don't, you know, yeah. Yeah. evacuating the lines and yeah. Yeah, right. bring in the pros for it. So the one thing that I will point out on the top right, you can see the interior air barrier that we've got there. We've got two layers of air tightness, one on the outside and one on the inside. They're both vapor permeable for those of you who care about permeability. I am not, uh, one thing that I learned here and that I'll, we'll talk about in a second when we talk about finishes is that um, plastic, I used to say is only good in like over dirt, like below a basement or a crawl space. Um, and, and that's basically it. Now I'm like, okay, 
bathroom floors and shower enclosures and stuff like that. Like <laughs> bathrooms important for plastic, but in general, I'm not big on vapor impermeability at any point in the house because I don't have a lot of clients in Southern Florida or Alaska. But that machine is a dehumidifier. So whether you have plastic in your house or not, I have no idea how anybody could be building a house for any length of time and not have a dehumidifier installed in the house as you're constructing it working. That thing pulled so much water out of the house that the concrete is drying. Yep. The house is airtight. And like, we know houses are airtight because it's law in most states now that houses are reasonably airtight. The five air changes are lower. And my opinion is that people are building airtight whether or not they know it. I had to do plenty of blow order tests for the first time for a builder who's never been tested before. And it comes in at two and a half air changes. And they're like, wow, that's good, right? And I'm like, yeah have you been installing mechanical ventilation? And they say, no. And I'm like, you've been building houses like this for 10 years and you haven't installed a single piece of ventilation equipment. That's, there's a problem. That's stinky. So, yeah. yeah. So anyway, uh, I think that the, the dehumidification while you're under construction, yeah. super important. Make that a part of your recommendations as you, as you go forward. Well, and then the other thing, you know, just in remembrance of the schedule, we went through multiple seasons and we are down here in Georgia where sometimes the air is liquid. Yeah. So. The one last thing that I want to point out about the, the ductwork in the crawl space uh, is that while my crawl space is four feet tall to the bottom of the, the uh, floor joists there, it's not quite enough. If it was 42 inches, or excuse me, if it was um, four and a half feet, so, you know, 54 inches, that'd be a lot better, a lot better. So if you're thinking about doing a crawl space, four and a half feet head broom is like considerably better. Second thing is that I put one run of flex duct just so that I could show the difference between them. Almost everything else in there, uh, right. except for the, the yeah. separations where you try to limit vibrations, is rigid metal duct. And that's that's my 100 year duct plan is because like that stuff just doesn't go bad. And it's all masticed to within an inch of its life. Mm -hmm. um, I did not do the duct design. I did my own load calculation. But then I had a friend of mine who does not want to be named because he doesn't want to be snowed in with, load, uh, with a duct design work. <laughs> Uh, do the duct design. And honestly, I still do not understand much about duct design at all. I really want to, and I'm going to try and put that on our YouTube channel or have a session about it soon, but it's like, that's really important. And I don't know how we're, how normal people are doing this. Cause I know that if we don't understand it, anybody yeah. in this session, like how are the HVAC guys out there who are installing ducts every day? Like they're probably not <laughs> getting the stuff that we're not getting either. It's just, they're not wondering about it. Um, it's just like something that you just do. In, in our case with the HVAC, I had put a dozen bullet points together of how of the process I wanted to be followed and to be installed. And our builder has his own person internally do the installation who does maybe 10 systems a year. He, I asked to be present when he did it. He passive aggressively avoided me. This was a little problem we had. Uh, he called me up after it had been installed. And I said, did you follow all this? And he was like, yeah, whatever. I, I did it right. I've been doing it long enough. Uh, it took us until December to find out that the heat pump uh, was installed improperly, which allowed moisture in the system, which basically trashed everything in the refrigerant circuit. And it all had to be replaced in February. Wow. So, um, you know, in spite of planning, <laughs> uh, but so I actually, like uh, you, you guys uh, imported two people. I imported someone from Ohio who I trusted uh, to come in and do the installation for us and like the second installation. <laughs> so lesson number one, uh, we, you, you know, anybody who wants to talk about building a high performance house, you're completely fooling yourself. If you think that you could have a single conversation that might have a basis in reality without having local professionals be part of that picture. And there, the fact is there are almost no local professionals anywhere in the world who understand any of what we are talking about at this entire conference. And it's they, getting better. It's, it's really, it's getting better. I, I have a longer career than you guys do. It's getting better, believe Thank me. <laughs> you, but, 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 you know, we need to like, when we say, oh, it, it just needs to be like this, like Bill saying, here's how it needs to be. Like we could do that all day long, but yeah. like ultimately you got to call a guy named Jeff, who's going to bring his two helpers and they're going to do this stuff. And like, what, what other choice do you have in some places in the country? It's like yeah. you're in the mountains, there's one crew 
yeah. that's there and they're going to go do another job today because they got a call for it and they're just not going to show up yeah so and what I, are you going to do fire them like you can't do that right and, and you just you got to put the ego to the side and you got to mm -hmm. have that conversation in the front too of like hey your ego to the side, my ego to the side. If we need to hold each other's hand through this process and make sure it gets done right, then we'll do it, you know? Um, and we don't have to be friends after this, but at right. the end of the day, I'm gonna live in this house for the rest of my life and I want it done right. Right, yeah. But but having that understanding up front and like, yeah, that's gonna cost more money. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. So jumping onto the topic of ventilation, I use something called the conditioning ERV that's made in um, in, in Illinois by Build Equinox. Uh, it actually has a, a quarter ton, th th third of a ton heat pump in it. Uh, mm -hmm. So it has exhaust and ventilation streams running through it, as well as a circulating air stream. It's got valves in it uh, that, that distribute the air. Uh, it's got a smart control on it. It has sensors in it. Uh, it's really pretty awesome. Uh, one of the cool things it does, I think it's smart because it assesses the air quality, only runs when it needs to run based upon the parameters you tell it to run on. It recirculates the air, which the, the inventor, Ty Newell, calls it recirculating the stores of fresh air because you don't live in every part of your house or aren't active in it at every part of the time doing different things. Uh, sometimes recirculation will balance things out without the need to bring in outdoor air to condition it. So this system runs independently of the heating and cooling system. So basically I have a fresh air system that gets, the fresh air gets conditioned by the heating and cooling system. They're, they're independently operating systems. Um, so, and it's also smart in the sense that it's off when it's not needed. A couple more slides here, because I think it's so cool. There's real-time control in this from anywhere through the web. This is what the panel looks like on both the unit and in the, on the website. It can tell you the temperature of the air coming into the unit, the humidity, humidity level of that, the temperature of the outdoor air, its humidity level, the CO2 level inside, and the VOC level inside. They also do a real cool thing with this. So your real-time data, you get historic data, which I'll show you in just a second, but they also have this little kind of composite chart of your exposure to poor air quality based upon CO2 hours of exposures during the day and VOC hours of exposure that are out. And then they have the sort of the different quality, like the, the manufacturer has a preferred range, ASHRAE 62.2 allow you to go out through this level and uh, poor IEQ moves out beyond that level. So it's a really interesting uh, type of composite value. They give you very visual, easy to communicate. Um, in this case, we had, this was running before we moved in. I was doing a lot of painting. You can see the VOC level spiking over 3000. The, the green band, and this is the historical data that comes from the unit. The green band shows you when it's running, the ventilation system is running. The orange level shows the VOC level and the pink line is the CO2 level. I think at this point I had it ventilating based upon VOC uh, being above like 800 or 1,000. So it was, it was running an awful lot. It also does the temperature trending, which I think is really interesting to look at. And this is the home wasn't occupied yet, so we kind of let it go wherever. But you can see the inside temperature, the sort of the diurnal variation in temperature as well as the weather, and then the extreme swings in the weather outside, which gives an idea that we built a good envelope that's uh, resisting the weather like it's supposed to. Uh, and then the humidity levels, both outside and inside, can be plotted too. Uh, we did some opening in the windows here, which let in a lot of humidity, and then we had to um, bring it back down again. So this is sort of like experimental play time before we occupied the place. So on our ventilation system, the uh, there was a lot of pressures is mainly what I was kind of buried in. For if, do you have any thoughts about our ventilation? system before we mm, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in with cooking and cleaning okay yeah. so essentially the uh, we're going to get there right now um the unit in the middle of the picture there next to the window is our exterior mounted kitchen exhaust fan mm -hmm. um that is the first step in making it quieter and the main reason that people do not use kitchen exhausts is because they are loud so if you want to make it quieter go with an outdoor mounted it's called a wall mount kitchen exhaust. Then it comes inside, there's a silencer on it. 
um, uh, which on you the can, inside. You can see a silencer on the, the left hand on the left. side. That picture on the left is the entirety of the makeup air system. So you can mm -hmm. see like our exhaust system is that one white box. The makeup air system is this huge system of components. So I'm just gonna say that it's worth it, but we built so airtight that we have to now do these things. I have to install indirect traps in my plumbing system that keep my condensate pump <laughs> an inch off so that I don't have bacteria migrating back up and into it and then like spoiling our house. And then because I don't want that to dry out seasonally, I have to install trap primers to drip, I'll dribble a little bit of water into the trap every time somebody flushes a certain toilet. And like, I have little pieces of plastic in our radon system now to like keep air from migrating back the wrong way in these tiny plastic pipes. So when you get to this level of anal building, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I know why no builder wants to build the way that we're talking about. We all, you know, Bill had to drag his kicking and screaming at some points and we had to drag our subs kicking and screaming. And like, it's because it's really hard to, you use one new component and you're, it potentially, it's gonna kill two days of work because something's gonna go wrong. You're gonna have to read the manual, Ugh, really? <laughs> and then uh, it's not gonna go the way that you want. And, and like, literally that's two, you just killed two days and now we're behind schedule. So that they just, they know that and they don't want to change. They, they have their right. way of doing it. They know that it works. They know where they can get the stuff, all that stuff. So, and so anyway. I mean, that's, that's, that's why some builders are custom builders, right? And even custom builders, don't really want to go step outside the box of what is custom to themselves. So what you see on the left here, this makeup air system that's from Fantech, is uh, the very far little dial, which mm -hmm. is a, a mechanical damper, comes in. That is a filter box. It's an on the diagonal filter. Comes through the black thing is the fan, inline fan, mm -hmm. that runs 700 CFM. Then a silencer that, that is an actual duct. And then on the right is a 10 kilowatt heater, much like Bill's strip heater, but this one is just for the incoming air so that the air, when it comes out into the kitchen, doesn't blow on your toes and make your toes cold. Mm -hmm. um, and that is important, not just for your toes, but also for uh, flooring or for mm -hmm. anything else. Like you got to warm that stuff up because if you bring a bunch, you bring, you know, 500 CFM into the house straight from outside, it's, it will literally make the floors crack out loud, it'll sound like popping. Pop. Um, and the materials in your house will do that. If you have an airtight enough enclosure and you don't preheat air that's coming in, you even just open windows and turn on a fan. Like it's gonna be, yeah. it, it's it's remarkable. Ask how us much. how we know. <laughs> Lesson number one. <laughs> um, and and then the other interesting thing, um, you know, the temperature, we're, we're in spring of 2021 right now, uh, in case you're watching this in the future. And, um, and the temperatures are starting to warm up, but it also still, it dropped down to 28 degrees the other night. Um, so we're still having these big temperature swings, but I feel like we're probably getting close to, to being able to adjust now. Now we have to, we've created the system. Now we need to probably adjust the, that warmer. We don't need it as much. But um, the other thing about the silencer, which is beautiful and wonderful, but the industry has not really thought it through. Um, well, people don't build the way that we're building. So we're doing something with this that's not normal, which is... Yes, but I feel like we've been talking about this for a couple of years now. Turn the hood on when you cook. Turn the hood on when you cook. Turn the hood on. The hood should come on when you cook. Why is the hood not just coming on when you cook? Also, turn the hood off when you cook. When you're done cooking. When you're done cooking. It's, why does it not just turn off when you're when you're cooking? Like those systems need to start talking to each other because a couple of times now <laughs> we have gone to bed and the, hood is, the hood is on. Because it's so quiet, you literally cannot hear it. Yeah. It's that quiet. So let me hit on radon real quick. Yeah. Um, the radon system is much more complicated than I had initially thought. If you were building smart, you would just do the simplest radon system possible, which is that you go down below the slab, there's a gravel bed down there. You go straight up out of the gravel bed, you go straight up through your house, you put your fan in your attic and you poop through the, the roof, period. If you're gonna do anything that's not that, 
Now you've got a whole, I made a literally 20 minute video about our radon system. Not, not like, oh, here's the fan and here's how it works. It's like all tweaks and tips that we had to use to make this radon system work and not get filled with water mm -hmm. and not um, pull too much air through from outside through the foundation wall. There are all kinds of crazy things going on. So anyway, it's like when you get to this, this level of building, every, everything starts making a much bigger difference than it used to when it was a normal house. The picture with my thumb up, is the uh, studio crawl space where I've got um, a HEPA loop, which replaces all the air in the room above, which is our multi-purpose room, the, the training studio, once an hour with hospital grade fresh air. Yeah. And then the ERV, which is oversized for that space as well. But basically we've got like a potentially very overventilated space, which that's where we're gonna have our dance parties and our mm -hmm. classes. And right now like in the pandemic still, that's where we're bringing people into the home for training. We're, we're, we're not doing tours quite yet. Um, and, and I am pregnant and we are young and healthy. So we have not been able to get the vaccine yet. Um, just because of eligibility groups, we have appointments now. <laughs> <But> <laughs> the, the one last thing yeah. about ventilation and about heating and cooling is that we used, um, a central return on our HVAC system. Bill, do you have a central or a, a central return on both floors? Okay. okay. All right, cool. We had just one. And, and the reason for that is because, not because it's cheaper, it's because you can induce pressure imbalances purposely. And that's something that we use in all of these systems. We've got pressure imbalances designed into the system to make pressure, to make air flow in a certain direction. And that's something that I had, has been clanging around my head for a couple of years and I really am like, I, I love it. So that's something that was very useful to us to think about um, in terms of designing these systems. Mm -hmm. So for interior finishes, I mentioned before the passive house uh, windows, um, which operate really well for ventilation. Uh, we do have carpeting on the whole upstairs floor, um, which is actually factory installed carpeting. Um, the first floor is all hardwood. It's uh, maple hardwood. Uh, so it's really easy to uh, run, run the vacuum around, um, robot vacuum now that we have. Uh, we have a really nice, uh, this this is looking down from the loft area, we call it, down into the, the great room, uh, which has a 22 foot high ceiling and lots of, uh, lots of windows. Um, we have uh, regular wallboard, painted walls, uh, carpeting, flooring, um, really not too much, too much else there in terms of finishes. We had really tried to to tell, and this is where we were like, okay, we're gonna freak it out because we've got a show that competes with home shows on like home improvement networks. But we wanted to just like really get people outside the box because the finishes is where the whole story is for HGTV. And uh, at the same time, as we were going through this build uh, or about to enter this build, we were brought in um, to a really fascinating indoor air quality project called Home Chem. Which we're doing a presentation on for this conference as well. Right. And, and so Home Chem opened our eyes to a, a whole bunch of interesting materials that scientists were testing and looking at, things that eat ozone, um, things that are just not made with compromised materials. Um, and that are more natural and interesting. And so we were like, oh, this is so cool. We're gonna use clay paints and we're gonna use um, magnesium oxide board. And, and we really had these aspirations um, to use some super cool products. And those products do exist, mm -hmm. um, but they're hard to, to necessarily work with um, because A, the companies are too small and then the founder gets COVID, right? And is gone for months and, or, or whatever. Um, and as you're moving through a build schedule, um, these things need to be readily accessible. And unless you're installing it yourself, you have to get a contractor who is willing to, do to go out on a limb and, and work with a material right. lamp, which are the red shower in the middle there. <laughs> that, is a, that is probably the most widely used waterproofing product on the market in the States. Uh, and, it's called Red Guard. And we hired a very well-respected um, contractor who had contractor. supposedly worked a lot with that product line and they did it wrong, even mm -hmm. though they'd worked with it before. And it's like, 
So anyway, you could pick even something that's normal, you know, like picking drywall. Mm -hmm. Honestly, one of the things about this, you can see the Intello interior air barrier there. One of the things about having an interior air barrier is that you get really, really touchy about anybody using a knife on drywall <laughs> or cutting a hole in drywall after it's installed. Cause like there's a, there's a very Stop! thin, very important membrane. It's my skin. So I forced the drywall contractor to pre-cut every hole for the outlets and for the light. They hate doing that. Mm -hmm. They can do it, they but can. you gotta like be a real dick mm -hmm. about it. And I, for sure, we actually like had the one crew that was here first. They all, I was like, look, you gotta get these guys out of here. They, and they kicked them out. Uh, and brought in another crew the next day because it was just like, I cannot deal with this. Yeah. So we had to use drywall. Drywall happens to be pretty chemically inert. It's not reactive. It's, uh, it probably has mold built into it at the factory. Mm -hmm. And you know this because there are studies that are done from Europe that show that. We have a really cool interview with a microbiologist um, whose name is Rob Dunn who wrote a, an excellent book called Never Home Alone. And just don't get it wet. That's why the redundant systems are so important. Yes. That's like lesson number one. <laughs> um, the pecan, you can see this big stack of nasty, dirty wood there. Yeah. That was a tree that was milled in Grace's parents' backyard. And the idea of reusing materials, good for you. Reuse materials all like you want. I'm just gonna say, that's a brand new tree, like newly dead tree, brand new milled wood, but it's technically a reuse because it came from somebody's backyard. It's a hundred year old tree. And I'm just going to say this because this is like a, you know, a conference session, just to keep it a little on your toes. We've showed up to the Miller's place. The, the Miller is the person who like planes the wood and makes it look nice and everything. So it had already gone through the kiln. Yeah. And so it's dried out and he was like, is that pecan? And he's looking at this dusty pot. I was like, wow, yes, you're amazing. You must be a genius. And he goes, I bet that's about as hard as a preacher's dick. <laughs> and it was, my God, this stuff is difficult to work with. So like, if you're gonna try and trim with something really pretty, uh, just working with one of these boards takes as like as much time as installing a window. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's totally um, It is beautiful. Uh, we've used it on all of our windowsills. We've used it totally on our hand it. railing, our bar tops. I mean, we've just yes. done some really cool stuff with it, but yeah. And because this is a lessons learned presentation, we're not going to show you like a bunch of the, oh, how beautiful our house is. Cause we wanted to make this about like, yeah. here's the things that, that went wrong. Right. Um, as far as lighting goes, I, I saved some money with the electrician by installing all the fixtures myself. And I swear to God, I don't know how they you're like with one hand, you're holding up the chandelier and with the other hand, you're trying to tighten down the stupid little nuts and you're standing on top of a- 18 foot ladder. <laughs> and you're, I, I've got like, yeah. I don't know. How, anyway, my muscles are going to come for the next five years about those. So I don't know how electricians do that. I will say that the lights are one of the things that we love about this yeah. house. Below those lights are is our flooring and mm -hmm. our house I already told you it has a dehumidifier running in it while we're building it. So it's the most airtight, most humidity controlled house in all of Atlanta. And they bring in this wood and, and it, it sits, sits there, there for two weeks. For two weeks. And they come in and they test it with like 30 randomly selected pieces and 30 randomly selected pieces of uh, subfloor around the house. And it didn't pass the test. And like, we're testing people. So I really hurt our feelings. I was like, what? So anyway, they came back and they did it. And I swear, even with all of that, the floors have gaps that are showing in the separating. It's like, it's, it's wood floor. It's so, a natural product that and again, has ebbs and flows. Yeah. yeah. So being a real anal, like trying to be a scientist about this stuff, it's wood, man. It's just good. Like it does what it wants. So Anyway, and you can see me and my parents installing the paint. We all painted the house together. Um, so it was like, this is just messy. All the interior finished stuff is like, I will say, the one last thing I'll say is that baseboards are the worst thing mm -hmm. in the entire universe as far as building a house. Because the whole point is that you just never notice them again. Yeah. But they take just as long as installing an entire HVAC system. And so are we finished with the house? No. 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 Yeah. Um, <laughs> excuse me for one moment. Yeah. <laughs> continue <laughs> so um dive into appliances yeah. that we chose here uh so we we have one hole uh that fails the whole patrol test 
which mm -hmm. is the microwave vent. We don't have a sophisticated exhaust system. We have a standard microwave hood system. Uh, it does run up to, I think, around 400 CFM. I can actually use it as a mini blower door to test the house. Okay. <laughs> um, but it does vent directly outside through the wall to a breezeway area. So there's not a lot of uh, convolution there. So we do get a really good airflow out. Um, the, there's an induction cook stop, which we love, uh, energy saving, as well as really supreme control on it. We did choose, a, a, of course, Energy Star dishwasher and, um, and fridge, uh, and a heat pump clothes dryer, as well as a, by a Miele, a German company. Uh, so this actually recirculates the air in the house. So that's one of the points of control we needed to have so that we didn't have to have something to, to worry about um, fans that were running when we didn't expect them to be running. So, uh, and that would also include the a heat pump water heater. So it just, it uses the air inside the house to extract heat. The clothes dryer uses the air inside the house to circulate through and extract or to heat and then to extract moisture from the clothes. It actually runs down the same drain line as the uh, as as the uh, clothes washer, so that's uh, sort of our our appliance layout. Mm -hmm. uh, did want to talk about ones on the topic of electricity, all electric home. We do have a solar array in in the yard. Uh, you can see the the perspective of it there. We do have available in our area net metering, which means we can bank kilowatt hours that we can then use from the utility. Uh, this shows sort of going into the fall, into the winter, uh, we were still banking energy, but we started to use more than we were banking. We ran out of our bank in December and January, but we're back into banking in February, as early as February, which is great. That's why I think we're going to hit net zero with this array. Uh, part of the problem was we were using three times as much energy because of that heat pump issue I mentioned. We're running on electrical resistance heat, which is about three times more um, costly energy-wise than uh, the heat pump would have been. There's also those things called solar renewable energy credits. Um, I, I'm actually on the board of advisors for the local Solar United Neighbors organization, uh, which is a national nonprofit. Uh, learned a lot about this and actually doing some uh, public speaking on the issue uh, because this is in front of the Pennsylvania legislature to open up the availability of community solar by providing a benefit if they require the utilities in the alternative energy portfolio to use more solar, utilities usually remiss to do so. They would just rather buy the solar production off of someone else, not the actual energy, but the production. So for every megawatt hour, someone will pay you in Pennsylvania. It's now, it's gone from 18 now to $30 per megawatt hour that a utility trades and pays me for that. Uh, this would be a, a nice offset to the you know tax incentives and the energy offsets you get from having solar. So I'm an advocate of that. That's cool. Are you saying that's 30 cents a kilowatt hour is what they'll pay? No, no, sorry. Went through that too fast. Uh, $30 per megawatt hour. Right. 30 cents per kilowatt hour. No. Uh, our cost for electricity is 16 cents a kilowatt hour. Okay. Boy, this is really messed up. Yeah. Uh, I know. <laughs> you were an engineer. I thought I was a pro too. Um, <laughs> That's okay. We'll save it there. All right. Should be there. Okay. So 16 cents per kilowatt hour is our cost to buy it, which includes all the costs. We bank it with the utility. If we have excess in the bank every year, they'll cash us out for 7 cents a kilowatt hour, which is the cost of generation. I see. Because we aren't paying for transmission to, to put it back on their grid. Cool. The, $30 per megawatt hour, so that's a thousand kilowatt hours, is paid because the utility needs to provide a certain amount of their energy portfolio from renewable resources and a certain amount from solar. So in states like the District of Columbia, they have a, a very strong proposal for renewables and alternative energy. The same megawatt hour I produce here that gets me $30 every time I make one megawatt hour in DC gets you $430. So they can become very strong incentives if by public mandate back to the utilities that will encourage more people to install renewable sources like solar. Interesting. Hmm. Uh, so on the uh, appliance side, this is not a commercial for Mila, but yes, we also have Mila oh. appliances. <laughs> 
Um, they are made in Germany and then shipped here. And that's one of the few things just because they were so the science um, that they put into their appliances is like, since we're talking about the science of homes, that, that was a pretty easy pick for us. Uh, we have the washer dryer, just like Bill has. That is our laundry room. And I just want to say, when you're like planning your laundry room, you might want to put more space in there. You see the yeah. towels on the left and the right is our water conditioning system. We've got a charcoal or a carbon filter on the left, water softener on the right, and then a salt reservoir, which is a little tiny robot. And, the in, same height as and in all fairness, often people would move those down to a basement. They wouldn't, yeah. they probably wouldn't be, but that wasn't an option for us basement. because we don't have the height yeah. because of those big granite slabs. We put in a central vacuum system, which is the red uh, warhead in our <laughs> laundry room there. And you can see the hose on one side and you can see all the attachments on the other. And, and I really like it. Um, <laughs> Again, not a commercial for Mila, but, <laughs> but the rest of our, our relationship together, we had one of those little Mila, little like pig vacuum cleaners, which we still use in the tiny house and it's amazing. But I just love not having this machine um, kind of follow me. I just like literally take the hose all over the house and it's it's been um, great. Uh, mm -hmm. Can I talk about the yes. kitchen? Okay, so the kitchen, let me just say that the, what you see there is not a range. A range is like a pre-assembled thing. This is components. So what you got is an oven. One of the things about Mila is that they make all 24 inch wide everything. Everything they make is 24 inches wide. The, the induction cooktop is not. But that's okay. because we chose a bigger one. So we've got a 24 inch oven with a 24 inch warming drawer that we put on top of it. That was pretty impossible to get that to fit. We have extra that's tall right. 38 inch countertop height. Mm. Uh, and I even had to put in a spacer under the lip of the induction cooktop. Because there was one tiny little fan port. That's like this tall. And so I just needed to create a little extra space. But the reason that that is all there is because the only right place for all of your cooking equipment to be is underneath the range hood. And the hood is not built yet, but that's our range, what's called the, the liner. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the so thing you, that actually you, sucks. You can see the silencer up at the very top of it yep. starting to be connected to it. Right. So um, so it does have lights built in and I'm trying to train myself to always turn on the light when I turn on the hood so because then that way I won't go to bed. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's still yeah. on. But um, that's like we're trying to <laughs> program behavior is a lot harder than trying to program the house to just go on autopilot. Right. And then the other thing, as you can see, uh, that's some of our dirt that we have dug through um, in my superwoman picture. That's, that is the sewer system. But again, nothing was viable on this property. We had to put in all new lines for water, sewer, gas and electric and it occurred to me like after i had purchased a gas range uh -huh. that um the only thing in this house was that was going to use gas was that and was it worth it to you know do all the work bring it in pay 40 dollars a month just to even have gas and uh and it wasn't it wasn't worth it so yeah. I will say, as somebody who gets freaked out about water, I've had emergencies with water. I've never had a fire in a house before, but I can imagine if I ever did, I wouldn't want anything that was on fire in my house. Again, yeah. I already hate having things that have water in them. And we have kids, which like everything is wet. Everything's a little, Why is this wet? Everything's a little sticky. Everything's a little wet. So, But I've really enjoyed the induction cooktop. And, and Bill, I don't know, had you used induction before? No. Yeah. I read a lot about it, though. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I too, and had watched some videos and you know, started looking up cookware. But um, the biggest problem that I have had is that it's just, it works too well. It works so quickly yeah. that sometimes I'll, I'll like boil something over because I just turned around to pick up a washcloth. Yep. Yeah, so that's, that's the only thing. It's been great though. You have to change your habits sure, yep. for sure. Right. I didn't know where else to put this sewer picture, but I just wanted to say we, we uh, dug <laughs> and placed our own sewer line. And I have to say it was one of the most enjoyable parts <laughs> of this entire build. I loved it. And then the, the plumber that I hired to come in and hook us into the, the uh, manhole that's across the creek. We had to go across the creek and everything. Um, 
we said, wow, you should go into business because this is one of the best sewer lines I've ever seen installed. And I just thought, I thought more about that. Nice. I'm not going to do that. He's but, got a backup now. Um, but the uh, point <laughs> of, view, of career, yeah. Yeah, right. And you can see the point of use water heater. We've got five water heaters in this house. Yeah. And it's the little octopus up top. Yeah. Right. And that was an interesting process. Um, Tuning them. Yeah, yeah. Like you can't just install it. It was one more lesson for us about like you pick, buy whatever you want however good it is, you put it in, right. you can't just walk away. You got to put it in, you got to test it, you got to find out what it's doing and then be like, ooh, I'm going to tweak, you got you to tweak it. So having somebody on site who can tweak things, who can measure and then tweak it is- And, and you, you know, I've, I've heard people praise and complain about tankless and point of use. And honestly, I think often the complaints are, they don't know how to tune it. They didn't tweak it. Yeah. They, yeah. yeah, controls, I think that, that's a big thing. And, you know, we're, we're experiencing things and fixing them ourselves, or at least recognizing. I shudder to think um, how someone else who lives in our, my house would even know what's going on, right. would know that something's correct or incorrect. So our living experience, um, pre-move in, I talked about the septic and sewer issue, the onsite water well, that, that was a tremendous experience. Um, something I don't want my favorite enemy to go through. But, but after move in, it's been very comfortable, very quiet with the air sealing details, the, the, um, the, the passive house windows. Our blower door score is just, the last time we tested, we hadn't, this doesn't include fixes we implemented afterwards. So we're less than 789 ACH 50. By the which way, is so around, I think you mean 789 CFM 50. I do mean 780, I mean 789 CFM 50. And it's one one point a little bit less than one point one ACH fifty, but we think we're better than that now. We just haven't tested it. We did some more fixes after that. Um, being all electric was great, except when the electric bill was high because the heat pump failed because of improper installation. Um, mean radiant temperature has been really nice. Being able to any walls, any surfaces, the floors are always uh, just around seventy degrees. The basement floor because the basement just tends to be a thermal well with all those heavily insulated walls. We did have some leaky windows we discovered. The manufacturer was local. They did come in and adjust the windows. Uh, we've had really low CO2 levels. In my old office, it used to get up to like 1300, 1500, 1800 PPM. Now I have the, the serve set to be 800 or less, uh, but we are seeing some high VOCs from new things that we're buying things that are still outgassing. We do have a radon issue, uh, which I think I've addressed with positive pressurization because you can control the serve to positively ventilate the house or keep it under the house under positive pressure. Um, so that's still a work in process, even though we did use, uh, like uh, you, you had mentioned, the um, sort of passive uh, radon resistant design uh, with straight from the slab straight up through into an attic space. We can add a fan up there. Uh, which we, we may have to do, but I, I'm sort of reticent to depressurize below the basement slab until I seal that. Uh, solar generation's been great. Uh, we've been net metering. Like I said, we've had a few electric bills here and there, uh, look on average to have zero. Um, that SREC value I mentioned, we did have well, one of the inverters drop out. So we went to half of the solar production. And again, I recognized it. The people that installed it didn't, even though they can monitor our system. Uh, I did find that it had it had a fault in it. it. Took them 20 days to fix it. I missed out on 20 days of solar. I'm pissed. <laughs> still, clearly, yeah. wow. Yeah, it's still burning me. Right. <laughs> um, we we do have um, landscaping plan. We just finished it. Um, if you want to look at uh, a video walkthrough, go to that short link bit.ly forward slash sunnyscape. Uh, we have named the property Sunny Field, so everything's got sunny in it, including our Wi-Fi, if you want to come and hack that. Um, so the landscape design you can see there is, is fairly elaborate, but we wanted this to be our, our forever home. That is a uh, uh, wildflower, uh, native wildflower meadow that you see there uh, with some tree plantings, a uh, little fire ring in front so we can sit and watch the night sky. Uh, watch the stars from our big sky view looking out towards the southeast. Um, this little feature here that looks sort of like some kind of symbol, it's an analemic sundial. Oh, 
Oh, cool. Um, if I never heard of that. I, I wanted some kind of sun feature because again, the sunny field aspect, if you look that up, basically there'll be a set of tiles, custom made tiles and stones there. When you stand on the stone relative to the month you're in, your shadow will cast to the time of day on the sundial. Wow. Cool. So it's it's interactive. Yeah. It's it, there's nothing sticking up out of the ground. You have to engage with this in order to tell the time. So another little solar sunny feature on the house. Okay. And is that a that's a cordoned off garden, like an edible garden up in the top right hand? Yes, that's a vegetable garden with uh, we, we hope a greenhouse. Yeah, with deer protect or seven foot high fence for the deer around here. Um so and we have uh, and this this is a south facing direction towards where all the all the greenery is and it also tends to roll downhill and away towards uh, church lane. Cool. Sure. Yeah. And right now with everything being open and clear, have you seen migratory like herds going through your uh, turkeys um, yeah. deer come through um, we've. We know there's coyotes around. Uh, we can hear them. I got a great recording from October of the coyotes in the hills. Um, and we see hawks all the time. Uh, a lot of small birds, large birds. Um, so th there'll be a lot of activity in here. That's the only thing that I, I think. Are you going to get chicken? Um, we, we haven't. We know a lot of people that do have it, but I'm a little hesitant on that. We want to do the garden first. Then we'll think about chickens later. Our, our neighbor up the road has chickens. So. Well, you're going to have your own birds and butterflies to, yes. to enjoy very yep. soon. Grace yeah, is going to have us do chicken coop, uh, but it's not going to be on our uh, living experience yet. Yeah. We have <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so far we had to get ready because we're, we're finishing up the television show. And so it's like not, you know, it's not part of finishing the house, but we had to have it be real enough and finished enough, the baseboards in, um, but not caulked and repainted or anything like that. So we, we're been kind of in a rush to do that. We also set up our training center. We wanted to start being able to generate some revenue since I've had two years of having this be my full-time job. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we've been able to do that and the training center works great. We're five minutes from the world's busiest airport, hmm. Atlanta airport. You haven't you heard can't hear, a thing. Yeah. I mean, so anyway, and we're not even in the soundproofed. We're not in the training center right now. We're we're actually in a, the living area of our house. And yeah. But as you can see, we've got our tiny lab parked right next yep. to our house. We've got our giant <laughs> truck, uh, which if you have three acres of land, it's a good idea to have a giant truck. Idea. And I, this is just one screenshot. We're right. uh, you know giving a little less detail than what Bill is giving, but our uh, I have a that's a Wave Plus that's monitoring that. Honestly, I don't like to plug specific monitors too much because i think they're all like con consumer monitors even for the prosumer ones are just not that they're not compared to the stuff that we saw at work in the, the home chem experiment uh, and and truly we we did get spoiled seeing yeah, these like million dollar equipment but i like this one because it monitors the co2 and the um vocs and the radon which is the big thing and i'm going to say that the radon the passive radon thing just not having the fan work absolutely did not work for us. We were at 14 parts per month per uh, whatever, pico curious per liter. Per liter yeah. Yes. yeah, before we turn on the fan. Now we're at atmospheric radon. So it's always rounds down to zero. Yeah. It's 0.3 or 0.2. Nice. Or whatever. Yeah. So yeah, it works like really well. But I mean, yeah, the radon is a, is a cross to bear for, for sure. It, it, it's annoying to us that people get one test on their home during yeah. any one day. And yeah. And for those of you who do blow order tests, how many of you have been in the house at the same time as the radon guy is setting up his things? And you're like, uh, you know, I'm about to fully ventilate this house. Mm -hmm. And he's like, ah, it doesn't matter <laughs> because they work for the developer or the, or the builder who wants to have a pass. So right. like, of course they're gonna schedule it during the blow order test. Anyway, the, the, the only thing that we'll say is that, uh, or that I'll say is that I had a really nice compliment from a friend of mine who's also in the building industry. He said that, I, uh, he had an old guy, uh, you know, like an old dog drive by our house and um, went back and talked to him. About it. He was like, yeah, you know that guy? He's, you know, he's going to be out there for a while, but it's going to be worth it because he's going to get the house that he really wants. So, but, but like I was watching him and he, he doesn't, he's not building very fast. So yeah. I just thought that was great. Cause like, yeah, it took a long time and yeah, it costs a lot of money. Like we didn't save 
We didn't you, save you would be amazed at how much money we did not save. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, but yeah, we got, I mean, this house absolutely is worth all the time and effort that we put into it. Yeah. And at the end of the day, money, you can always make more of it. Right. And the one, the, the yeah. one note that I've got here, which is our lesson learned number one on living experience is uh, now that we're here, something like a doorbell. If I want to wire a doorbell so that I can have it fed from electricity from inside, it means that now I have to poke a hole in not just my wall because my wall in my brain because i built this place is not just one thing it's drywall it's a lasagna. interior mm -hmm. air barrier then we've got you know three and a half inches of insulation then i've got an exterior air barrier with osb then i've got two inches of exterior insulation then i've got a rain screen then i've got my siding and like i have to drill a hole through the whole entire thing and i will never air seal that yeah because you can't get at the interior layers of the sandwich anymore so now i'm like I think that the rim joist is a big, I need to have the rim joist accessible because that is where I'm pretty sure all my penetrations forever right. are going to have to be made because I've got one, the surface material. Yeah. Out there is my air tightness layer. And then I can take the insulation out, do my thing and put the insulation back. That is the only place in the entire house where I can make changes where there's going to have to be a hole in the wall. Yep. And I did not think about that beforehand. So that's something that's just kind of been troubling me lately. Is that is that a trouble for you too, Bill, or did you think everything through? Um, we pretty much because it was factory built, all the penetrations were there. So as they built the walls, they built them from the inside out. Um, so they would put up the interior sheathing and then uh, put out whatever penetrations and then foam around them and then apply the insulation, then the exterior. And for the record, you don't have to have a wired doorbell. No, now. it's a 21st century. But if I did, yeah. then it's, it becomes a problem. Yeah. And I mean, we do still have some pigtails out there for, you know, like a fan and then an outdoor oh, yeah, exhaust. All kinds of upgrades. We still um, have those but we got to make some money first. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we that was a little bit of a long presentation, but thank goodness we didn't have any questions. But right. um, I know, but, thank you. But none of them yeah. came telepathically either from the future. So yeah, right. And here is the slide with our contact information. Yep. And so please do feel free to get in touch with Bill or with us. Um, we we talk about this and think about it. Night and day. Yep, a little bit too much. And uh, I do have a website, and you know, Corbin Grace, I have one, of course, homediagnosis.tv. I have one for my home. A little less material there, popular less material, but it's bonehome.com. If you want to keep up with that, it's a blog. You could uh, follow that too. And are you at Sunnyfield on Instagram? We are at Home Performance on Instagram. No, I haven't done that yet. Um, that That's a good idea. Bill's I'll see if I can grab that. Facebook. You're pretty easy to find on Facebook. Yeah, fa Facebook. I have a private Facebook group with 512 of my closest friends who are in the Spoon Home Personalized Performance Home Group. So. He's the, the homecoming queen. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I, didn't, I didn't even get invited. <laughs> <laughs> my headphone tiara. So. Not to his group. I'm in his group. Um, well, thank you everybody for taking the time tonight or yeah, it's tonight, right? It's, it's an evening uh, to go through this journey with us and um, we hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. And thanks uh, for what you do. And uh, thanks everyone for listening. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thanks to the Home Performance Coalition for having the conference. Absolutely. We'll hope to see you guys in person next year. Yes. Somewhere yes. wonderful. Yes.